Um, so we'll get right to it. Uh, I'll be talking about Earth-like planets, but at higher obliquities. And I figured I'd start with this image because all the cool kids have a Trappist-1 figure in their presentation. Uh, but I will not be talking about tidally locked, so we're not talking about Trappist-1. But I like how they compared it with Venus and Mars. So as we're now getting excited, we're seeing Earth-like planets, and we want to say whether or not they're habitable. We want to characterize their climate. But if we think about what we know about Venus and Mars and all the data that we have for Venus and Mars and how much we still struggle to explain their climate, their paleoclimate, um, we just debated yesterday what would happen if you just sort of swapped them around and changed their insulation. So with all of those challenges with Venus and Mars, how do we then you know, hope to characterize these exoplanets? So there's been a lot of interest in being able to relate orbital parameters and very simple quantities to a planet's climate. And out of that come rotation rate studies and our study looking at obliquity. We know obliquity is important for climate. We've known this on Earth with the Milankovitch cycles and glacial periods, but that is due to just a plus minus one degree in obliquity. Uh, we have an even bigger source of inspiration from Mars in our own solar system whose obliquity has varied between 10 and 60 degrees. So that would have massive implications for the atmospheric circulation and the dynamics. And so for this study, we wanted to then take a look at what higher obliquity planets really would look like, even if they were just Earth-like. So even if we knew we have an Earth-sized planet with an Earth-like rotation rate, even an Earth-like composition, what does shifting the obliquity really do? To that planet. So we're doing this with a very simple model. It's very idealized, no clouds, just a gray radiation scheme. Slab ocean. Um, we're doing this with a one meter mixed layer depth. Those are the results I'll be showing you today. That allows us to really see the full seasonal behavior. Uh, you could do this with a deeper mixed layer, but it'll dampen some of your results. Um, I'll give you a sneak peek of that. Uh, but in reality, with when you use a one meter mixed layer, that's a low heat capacity surface, so the effects you're seeing are more like what you would see over a continent rather than an ocean. And we'll do this, we ran simulations from 10 to 85 degrees. I'll mostly just be contrasting the normal Earth-like to the 85 to give you an idea of that range. Okay, So, uh, I will give you a sort of tour of the 85 degree planet, but one of the things I wanted to showcase is really the importance of seasonality when you're considering these planets. Um, which may seem counterintuitive because I just said it's hard to characterize climate and most of the time we're happy if we can get an annual mean, planetary mean idea of what the planet looks like. But for these planets, you do need to take into account the seasonality even for the annual mean conditions. So I'll show you what I mean. Uh, first, if we do this for the 23 degree case, on the left you have your uh, seasonal uh, variability, you have latitude over time, surface temperatures are shown in color, insulation is a dashed line, and we can then just average this out and take the annual mean. So on the right you have your annual mean insulation and your annual mean temperature. And if instead I then force my model with just the annual mean without varying the seasonality, I would obtain surface temperatures that look about the same. And hence we do this for Earth studies to look at a lot of different features. But, and I get that traditional circulation that one has sort of already talked about, so I don't even have to cover. You get your ITCZ near the equator, your descending branches at the pole, uh, at the poleward edge of the Hadley cell, it all looks good. Now we switch over to 85. At 85, you'll notice you're getting more extreme temperatures. You're seeing uh, maximum and minimum temperatures you weren't seeing before. It's on the same color scheme. Uh, and if you average the insulation, you're now actually putting more energy into the poles than you are at the equator. This is true for all obliquities larger than 54 degrees. Um, and so when you average your temperatures, you're actually getting a rather flat temperature structure, even though you have very extreme temperatures, they average out. But because you're now varying your, your insulation more and you have these extreme temperature structures and there's nonlinear relationships here, if you force the model just with your annual mean, you would actually severely overestimate your planetary temperatures. At the very least, 10 Kelvin to up to 20 Kelvin at uh, the higher latitudes. You're also somewhat changing your horizontal temperature gradients. Uh, so even if your first order of magnitude objective is to just say whether or not this is habitable, by missing your peak temperatures, you're creating several problems in your characterization of the planet. This has implications for your circulation. If you force a model, for example, with your annual mean insulation, you would actually be getting a reverse Hadley cell. 
uh, reverse in the sense you get descending motion at the equator, ascending motion at the poles. Uh, it's also very weak and somewhat unstable. And it's not what you actually get. A high obliquity planet, if you force it seasonally, has very strong cross equatorial cells. Um, they're stronger than the 23 degree case. Uh, we'll see them a little bit more later. But the point being that even if you wanted to get, say, surface winds or high altitude winds for your simulation, you're going to want to be looking at the seasonal variability to get your magnitude. Because if you just ran it with your annual mean, you're going to be really underestimating your winds. Precipitation as well, even though that's a little bit further in the future as far as our concern for these planets. Um, but on the left, you have precip. Uh, you'll notice that, for example, with the annual mean, you'd actually expect your ITCZ in the 20 degree range. Uh, wherever, however, with the seasonal forcing, your precipitation is actually tending to higher latitudes. And you get this extra additional precipitation you wouldn't be seeing otherwise. Uh, but a more immediate concern is if you look at the water vapor in your atmosphere throughout the year, uh, because there's a nonlinear relationship there, again, between temperature and atmospheric content, uh, water vapor content, if you use your annual mean forcing, you're actually underestimating the water vapor in your atmosphere by about a factor of four. And this is in a model that doesn't even have water vapor feedbacks yet. Uh, so you can imagine, depending if you're going to then add on some chemistry, some feedbacks, this could just become a compounding error. Uh, of course, this is done for our model with a very extreme seasonal cycle. You could imagine cases where this is larger or smaller as an effect, but it is definitely an effect you want to account for. So now back to sort of the tour of an 85 degree planet. Um, I'll talk about the energy transport first in the 23 degree case, just to remind us of how these fluxes work. Uh, this is northern hemisphere summer solstice, so you're having summer in the north. Uh, your transport is being done in the low latitudes by the mean circulation, so basically your Hadley cell is taking your energy southward. In the extra tropics, the eddies take over and they transport that energy down gradient to the, to the winter hemisphere as well. Uh, when we switch over to the 85 degree case, you'll notice that the circulation is now stronger, about three times stronger, uh, and your mean circulation is dominating. Your eddies have practically disappeared here. So your mean circulation is now broader and stronger, and you can see this also in the form of a Hadley cell, a little bit more intuitive. You'll notice your Hadley cell now is reaching into higher latitudes so with sort of a weak uh, but broad rising branch. Uh, it's also very angular momentum conserving in the high obliquity case. So going right along, uh, as we change the transport and we change the Hadley cell, this of course has implications for precipitation. There are a lot of different interesting precipitation features and they are very instructive as far as understanding the atmosphere, but I won't go through them all. Uh, the one that of course always stands out is the ITCZ, in part because uh, diagnostics for the ITCZ are still very much debated for Earth. As we talk about climate change and we want to be able to predict what's going to happen, it's something that affects a large portion of the population. So we figured this would be a good chance to sort of test these diagnostics. Uh, so we went and looked at how the ITCC location worked out in the high obliquity cases. Uh, there's a couple of different ways to quantify where your ITCC is happening. Uh, the details don't matter too much here, but here are three different ways of quantifying it. And we then test it with diagnostics that are used on Earth and behave reasonably well for normal uh, Earth conditions. And, the, and these are the moist static energy maxima and the energy flux equator. Moral of the story is they don't work out too well uh, for the high obliquity cases. The moist static energy maxima goes all the way to the poles, uh, where of course you have your higher temperature, your higher water vapor content, but that is not where your ITCC goes. Uh, your energy flux equator trails somewhat closely, but doesn't do a very good job as a diagnostic for these cases. Um, so that remains sort of an open question and an area for work, uh, but it does show the potential of these extreme climate scenarios as a way of testing the limits of some of our terrestrial theories. But what I really want to show you is this high latitude precipitation, your polar precipitation that's happening in these models, because it's not something we'd seen before. Uh, for the normal 23 degree case, we usually describe this, we study this by using the moisture budget. So net precip, P minus C, in the low latitudes, it's compensated by mean moisture flux convergence. In the high latitudes, it's compensated by eddy moisture flux convergence, so your gray and your green lines. When we go up to high obliquities, we now have another term that's dominating, and that's your storage term, your time derivative. 
So what is that really doing? Here you have the northern hemisphere summer, and the storage is shown in color. And then the black lines there are large-scale condensation. So at the start of the summer, your temperatures are going up. This is high obliquity, so your temperatures are rising faster and to higher temperatures. And so with temperature goes saturation vapor pressure, and your atmosphere takes up a ton of water. Uh, your advection is pretty small in this region. The water mostly sits there until oh, a little while later, your temperatures start to drop very rapidly at the end of the summer. Uh, temperatures drop, saturation vapor pressure drops, and the water is forced to condensate out, and you get these large-scale condensation features towards the end as you're transitioning from summer to winter. And you'll notice that this is now not only the dominant term at your pole, but it's actually dwarfing some of your more traditional low-latitude features. So just to sort of give you a little bit of peace of mind, we've run this with a couple of other model setups. I'm showing you here two extra ones, uh, the two that we talked about before, the 23 and the 85, but also the 85 with a primitive water vapor feedback added in, which of course amplifies this feature. And an 85 degree case with a 25 meter mixed layer depth. By making the mixed layer depth thicker, you dampen a lot of this. You'll notice the scale on that figure is about three times smaller than the other two, uh, the other three. Uh, but even though all of your fluxes are somewhat reduced, your storage term is still very dominant in the polar region and is still very high compared to the other fluxes. So while it is quantitatively different, qualitatively, it's still a very important transport. Um, yep. So just to full circle back to the original point of you should care about your seasons, uh, if you run annual mean forcing, you will of course not have your time bearing term that is gone. Uh, and you would be seeing surface temperatures that look more like that than what we actually did. And because of the nonlinearities, you would be underestimating all of your water vapor content. And I will leave the conclusions and stop for questions. So let's get one question. I'm going to use my co-chair's prerogative and just um, make a comment that Pluto is a really interesting case of high obliquity in our own solar system mm -hmm. um, where... Uh, you know, we obviously don't have precipitation, um, at least that we know of, but you have the volatiles, uh, the nitrogen and methane ice concentrated at low latitudes because that's where the minimum in um, in radiative forcing occurs, not at, not at the poles. So, anyway. So, I would expect uh, as you increase the surface heat capacity, mm -hmm. the annual mean should converge to the seasonally varying. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you change the heat capacity and where that threshold is and how it compares to the surface mix layer of 50 meters. Uh, okay, yeah, so we, we've done a few model runs going up to 50 meters, so 10, 25, 50. Um, and that leads to larger delays in your changes. So your seasonal changes are a little bit more uh, diffused out. Uh, at 50, you're still not quite at the annual mean. You're getting there. Um, but like I showed you at 25, you still do see a lot of these signals. They're a bit more delayed and they're a bit dampened in intensity, but they're still there. So I can't quite tell you exactly where it would converge, but um, I would say that probably for most planets that don't reach a full dynamic ocean like Earth's, which is asking quite a lot, um, you'd probably still see a lot of these signals. Do we have any other questions? All right. Oh, right there. there. So you looked at an Earth-like planet. Mm -hmm. uh, if you thought of a planet that was uh, around, say, an M dwarf, and so it has a period that's kind of comparable to its rotation period, mm -hmm. and it had very high obliquity. Now we have essentially two Coriolis forces to deal with. Mm -hmm. How does this work? So part of the reason we haven't even dealt too much with something tidally locked or close to tidally locked is because people who do dynamics more than I do uh, have sort of suggested that it would be very hard to sustain a high obliquity tidally locked planet. Mm -hmm. um, so therefore we haven't <laughs> spent too much time worrying about that yet. Um, but it's definitely an interesting question. I don't have an answer for you. 